So in this talk, I'm going to talk about knowledgeable machines. Uh, so with the advances in AI and machine learning, uh, increasingly we are asking machines to perform tasks uh, that uh, traditionally humans have been doing. And, uh, and in order to do those tasks, uh, we have uh, utilized our knowledge about the world uh, that we have accumulated over our entire lifespan, right from uh, when we were in the womb, and that collection of knowledge about the world is going to continue till we die. So on the screen, uh, you see a robot called a cobot at CMU, uh, whose task is to basically go around and help people in the office environment. Right? So you could potentially ask cobot uh, to go and collect a printout that you have fired, or like you know, go and get a cup of coffee. Right? So in order to do this non-trivial task, uh, the, the, the machine, the robot in this particular case, needs to have a shared view of the world with you and me. Right? But unfortunately, uh, these machines right now don't share that same worldview, which is really important to do these intelligent decision-making tasks very well. So that brings us to the main thesis of my talk, which is that background knowledge is really key to intelligent decision-making. Right? And we, as I mentioned, we're increasingly asking machines to do those same tasks as you and I do, from which we benefit from having the world knowledge, but machines don't have access to that knowledge. So to just to drive home the point, let's say I don't have time to go and read 10 different websites every morning to get the today's news, and I want to build a system which can summarize the news for me. And once the system goes and finds a sentence, um, it says that state farm stocks tumble along with Berkshire Hathaway. For us as humans to interpret this particular sentence, we need to know that uh, there's a concept called company, uh, and two instances of companies are mentioned here, which is State Farm and uh, Berkshire Hathaway. There is something called a stock market, where company uh, stocks are traded, and there are prices associated with them. Right? But none of those additional knowledge, which is necessary to understand this particular sentence, is mentioned in the sentence itself. Right? So we have built our knowledge about the world, about these companies, concepts, and stock prices and all. And we are using all of that knowledge to make sense of this particular sentence, right? But machines, as I mentioned earlier, don't have that same uh, understanding and shared view of the world. So even if you knew all of that background knowledge, why there might be a correlation between the stock prices of these two companies, that's not immediately clear. But if I showed you some structured knowledge which could support these two, uh, this particular sentence, which says that uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is mentioned in this particular sentence, has a subsidiary called uh, Heinz, and Heinz in turn is being insured by State Farm, which is also mentioned in the sentence. Right? So one plausible explanation of why there might be a correlation between the stock prices of these two companies is that the market may think that uh, the losses of, of Berkshire Hathaway is because of its subsidiary Heinz, and the losses of the Heinz company are going to ultimately get consumed by the insurance company State Farm. Right? So now, because we have this kind of structured knowledge, uh, our interpretation of this sentence, even as humans, are much deeper now compared to, say, 30 seconds before, when we didn't have this background knowledge. Right? And the background knowledge that we see, which is organized as a uh, multi-relational graph here, is fragment of a much larger graph that we call is the knowledge graph. Right? So that's the main uh, crunch of the idea here, is that if you are able to organize our knowledge about the world in the form of some structured repository, in this particular case, a knowledge graph, then we are able to make that available to intelligent decision-making AI and machine learning agents, then their performance is going to improve significantly. So now if you agree with me on that particular point, then the question is how are we going to build these large knowledge repositories or large knowledge graphs? So one solution could be that we actually ask humans and to type them, type in all this knowledge, but that's not really going to be scalable because uh, there's a lot of knowledge that has already been produced and then there's a long, and it's, a, it's a constantly evolving process as well. Right? So rather than uh, crowdsourcing or typing all this knowledge ourselves, our goal is to see how we can leverage already existing data. So we as humans, we have been documenting our knowledge through emails, tweets, chats and all, and with the growth of the internet and the world wide web, 
there's an explosion of that type of data that's readily available out there on the web. So the question is how we can leverage all of that data and extract from this purely unstructured data, which is written in natural language, how we can extract the type of knowledge graphs that we had seen in the previous slide. Right? So that's, that's the main goal that we're interested in doing here. So whenever I say uh, we need to extract and harvest this knowledge from web scale unstructured natural language data, what do I really mean? So let's say out of those millions and billions of set, uh, documents, let's consider two of them. And one of them says, uh, Luke Erwin is the current mayor of Pittsburgh. And the other one says, after the death, death of then Mayor Bob O'Connor, uh, uh, Luke Erwin became the new mayor, right? So any one of us reading these two snippets will quickly infer that we are talking about two people here, which is Luke Erwin and Bob O'Connor. There's a location named Pittsburgh, and there's a mayor of relationship between these two entities and this particular location, right? And there is also a temporal aspect to that because both of them were not mayor in the city. So uh, whenever I'm talking about knowledge harvesting, we're talking about how we can build machines which are good enough readers, which can read these kind of textual data at scale and is able to recognize what kind of entities are mentioned in that data, what kind of relationships exist among those entities, and how those relationships will evolve over time. And the fragment of that I have shown in this particular slide. So by the way, this is also not an abstract academic pursuit, this idea of building knowledge graphs and making it available for improved decision making. In fact, right from around 2012 or so, whenever you search in Google, you may have seen this kind of panel on the right hand side. So in this case, I search for Accenture, and you have seen, uh, we see this knowledge panel, as it's called, where it quickly summarizes a lot of things about that entity. So in this particular case, I can know a lot about who the founders of Accenture are, like you know what their headquarters is, what their stock symbol, things like that. So the benefit is that now I don't have to go and read 10 different web pages to get the same summary information about Accenture, and it improves my web search experience, right? And probably all of us are beneficiaries of this kind of panel. And the nice thing is that these knowledge panels are internally being powered by a knowledge graph of the form that we had seen before. Right? So you and I are already beneficiaries of this technology, but it's not a solved problem. So Clarence Delaney happens to be one of the co-founders of Accenture. So when I went and looked for Clarence Delaney, I didn't find as rich knowledge panel as in the case of Accenture. Right? So uh, there's a, a good start, but there's a long way to go in terms of building a comprehensive knowledge graph. So the NEM project at CMU, uh, where I was also part of, and we continue to do that line of research at IIC, uh, is an attempt to read basically documents at web scale and extract and organize uh, the knowledge that's trapped inside that unstructured data. So in particular, the NEL system has been running continuously for more than seven years now. January 12th happens to be NEL's birthday. Uh, you're welcome to come and celebrate a birthday in our lab or in Pittsburgh uh, in one of those locations. And in addition to uh, extracting knowledge about the world from large unstructured data, uh, it's also able to do reasoning over that extracted knowledge. For example, yeah, if, we, if Mel knows that Shikha is a place for Team India and Team India plays for cricket, then Nell will be able to infer that uh, Shikha actually plays for cricket, even though that particular fact may not have been present up front. And additionally, it's also able to discover new predicates or new types of knowledge that it thinks is necessary to learn about a particular domain. So just to give you an example, uh, at one point, they knew a lot about rivers, and then it also knew a lot about cities. So then it saw that by analyzing data, that people mention rivers and cities in close proximity with much more probability than random chance. So it came up with this new predicate or new type of knowledge it's called river flows through city. So that becomes a new learning task for them, and then the job will be to find additional instances of that new type of knowledge and basically densify or populate further the knowledge graph that it has been made. 
So this is, of course, a work of a much larger group that I'm presenting on their behalf. So uh, what you see here on screen is basically a fragment of the knowledge graph that Nell has accumulated by reading over this uh, more than seven years now, where the nodes are entities of interest, like the Toronto Maple Leafs, and the tight edges are the relationships that basically connect two entities, which says Toronto Maple Leafs' hometown is the Toronto. So you can go and browse this whole uh, knowledge graph at the URL, uh, rtw.ml.cmu.edu. And those of you who are on Twitter, you can also actually go and uh, follow Nell at this handle CMU Nell. So that's really, and uh, what we have observed is there are actually a few thousand human followers who follow Nell on Twitter. And Nell also tweets from time to time facts or beliefs that it thinks is interesting and not always politically correct, but it tries its best. Uh, and what we also have is that we have feedback coming from these humans. So here you have a situation where you have an AI agent which is reading these facts on its own, tweeting about them, and humans are giving feedback. So it's a really interesting open question, is how we can leverage this inter interchange of ideas between an AI agent and a few thousand humans to build better AI agents altogether. So how has Nell performed over time? So you saw the, uh, the, the fragment of the knowledge graph that has automatically extracted, but some quantitative numbers. So in this particular plot, on x-axis, you basically have a number of iterations. So and that's a proxy for time. And the y-axis in this first plot, you see how many beliefs Nell has accumulated. So the general trend you see that over time, Nell has been able to extract more and more beliefs by reading these documents from the web on a continuous basis. So right now, Nell has crossed 1,000 iterations and it has accumulated more than 100 million uh, beliefs automatically from the world. And by belief, I mean basically facts of the form that MIT Warrenville is located in Warrenville. So basically one edge from the graph. So, so size is one aspect, but also in terms of quality, when we found, when we did the evaluation, we found that over time, then has been able to uh, basically hold down on the quality and not degrade in terms of performance. So on average, then it tends to be about 80 to 85 percent accurate. So here you have an AI agent which has been running continuously, pretty much self-supervised without external inputs for more than seven years now. It has been able to read documents and extract beliefs which has crossed more than 100 million mark and has not degraded in performance. So as far as I know, it's probably one of the first instances of having this kind of self-supervised agents which is able to run over extended time horizons and is able to learn effectively as, as much as that has done. So which is really interesting. So now our research kind of goes beyond this and also has some connections to neuroscience that I want to quickly uh, list out. So if you think about this text and the documents that whose semantics and knowledge uh, we are trying to organize, so these are usually not machine generated, right? So these are written by humans, so there is some processing happening inside our head, and that process is generating all that data on our, uh, for data for, uh, for us, and we are trying to model the knowledge of the data. But with advances in fMRI and brain imaging techniques, we also have a direct peek into that same latent phenomenon of what's going on inside our head. So rather than looking at, so we have one common source and we have two data sources, basically two different views onto that same common phenomenon. So rather than looking at each one of them in isolation, our goal is to how we can basically connect and exploit both modalities, so text and brain imaging, to get a better handle into how and what is happening inside our heads. So we, are, we have also done uh, research in that direction, and we have found that when you combine these two modalities, you are able to answer questions that will be really hard to answer if you're just looking at one modality or the other. So uh, there's, of course, a lot more work that needs to happen, but that's an early promising direction. So uh, with the convergence of uh, data, computation, and advances in statistical and machine learning techniques, 
Uh, we have, I think, for the first time in human history, a real opportunity to go from big text to big knowledge. A text is just one of the modalities that we are focused on, but there are potentially other modalities like speech and vision. But the point here is that we have a true opportunity to basically, basically aggregate all the knowledge, all human knowledge, into one structured form and make it available to AI machine learning agents and overcome the knowledge bottleneck, which has plagued AI agents all along. Right? And uh, nowhere in history, basically, this was possible. So this is really exciting times, which also keeps us motivated to work on the problem. And through, uh, uh, through our research, which spans the areas of machine learning, natural language processing, and large-scale data analysis, we want to organize these kind of structured knowledge graphs, make it available to AI and machine learning agents, and hopefully that results in better decision making. So this is a really uh, uh, area which is in its infancy, and my sincere hope is that at least some of you will take up the challenges in this area and contribute tremendously uh, towards building better uh, AI agents. With that, uh, thank you for your attention.